It's been three weeks now since Easter. But personally, I always come off Easter Sunday with something of a spiritual and an adrenaline high. Like, I can't sit down, I can't rest, I gotta keep moving, which was convenient this year because we drove till midnight that day after church on our vacation. And I never once got tired because I had all that adrenaline going. There's something exciting about the empty tomb and the knowledge that sin and death have been vanquished, that a whole new world has begun on the eighth day as God begins his recreation with the resurrection story of Jesus. But... But then you eventually crash and go to sleep and you wake up on Monday morning and you wake up each day after that for three weeks now. And for three weeks we've been reminded that we may have celebrated Easter, but we are not living in that new creation yet fully, are we? We've heard of chemical attacks in Syria, of famine in Yemen, of trade wars and political scandals, of a bus crash that killed all those high, those high school or young um, hockey players in Canada a little over a week ago. A woman flying on a southwest plane is, is gone when an engine fails. Our world is not as it should be. And then there are the personal struggles we've experienced in our own congregation. People dealing with heart issues and death of loved ones and depression and, and marital struggles maybe. And so we may celebrate a new creation in God's conquering of sin and death on Easter Sunday. But for me, I wake up each day and I have to admit that sin is still alive and kicking in me at least. I still struggle with selfishness and with anger and with gluttony. My wife started buying waffles after we came back from spring break, the frozen waffle kind. And one of my kids had six of them yesterday. And, and I have to admit, just between you and me, since this child is not here, I'm jealous because I want six of the waffles. I only had four. And two pancakes. Gluttony is still alive in me. You know, it's been more than 2,000 years, almost 2,000 years since Jesus was raised, and yet there has not yet been a second coming, has there? Heaven and earth are still estranged from one another, not joined together yet. And if we're honest, our world is just as much of a mess today as it has ever been. It's not any worse, it's always been bad. And it's enough to make you give up an exhaustion and frustration sometimes. And then I was reminded just over a week ago of this, of a great story about Itzhak Perlman. I am not a classical musician by any stretch of the imagination, but he is the world's greatest living violinist. And there's this great story about Itzhak who, it's probably not true, so just let me tell you, the story probably didn't happen, but it's a great story, so let me tell it to you anyway. So this way the story goes. Itzhak is at, in, in a concert, and about halfway through the piece in which he is the soloist with this whole symphony behind him, his, his top string breaks on his violin. Now, if you know anything about playing the violin, and I know absolutely nothing, but if you know something, you know you cannot play a great piece of music with three strings. And any great violinist has a backup violin because you never know when a string could break. But Itzhak does not stop the piece. He does not call for his backup violin. He keeps playing with three strings and he adapts and he adjusts on the fly with his three strings and the broken one and it's awe-inspiring and the whole audience when he's done stands up and they cheer for an encore because it is the most amazing thing they've ever seen. It was beautiful. Itzhak stands up and he sets his violin down and he walks over to the microphone. It's clear there will be no encore. He stands there a moment until the crowd quiets down and then in the absolute silence, Isaac says this, and we, uh, the quote should be up on the screen for us, I think. He says this, Sometimes it is the artist's task to find out how much music you can still make with what you have left. And then he sits down. Now, I spent a good two hours trying to verify this story because I love this story. There is no way that could happen because no one wrote about it. And if that happened for real, it would have been in the newspapers the very next day probably did not happen. And yet, there's a truth in that story for us. Because this is the call of everyone who seeks to follow Jesus, to try to make the music that we can with what we have left, to take our broken, messed up, entirely fallible and limited selves 
and give it our all to live into the kingdom of God that Pastor Rick talked about a couple weeks ago. To live in such a way that our world begins to glimpse that moment when heaven and earth will be joined and made one that we see in Revelation 21 and 22 when Jerusalem comes down. That world where there's no more crying or tears, where there's no more death or sadness, where there's no more violence or enmity between nations, but there is genuine unity and peace and justice in the world. We're called to live and strive for that. To begin to live in such a way that, that we experience at least a taste of what the true shalom was like in the Garden of Eden, knowing that it will get even better. That's what we're called to do. This is the call of every disciple, to take what we have, as broken as we are, and make the best music we can, pointing to that kingdom. And the question that I want us to think about today is, if that's what we're called to do, to make that kind of music, to live into that kingdom... How do we do that? How do we get there? How do we begin to live into that kingdom world? For the Jews in the first century, you began to live into that kingdom of God by following the Torah. The Torah are the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. We all know the main rules in the Torah, the main guidelines. We think of Exodus 20, Deuteronomy 5 that have the Ten Commandments. And so we know you shouldn't lie or steal. Um, you, should, you, should, uh, you should only worship God. You should rest and honor the Sabbath day and, and keep it holy. Those sorts of things. But if you are an observant Jew, you know that if you read through the Torah, those first five books, the law of God, there are not Ten Commandments in them. There are 613. And so you will follow all 613 of those commands. But sometimes those commands are hard to follow. They're hard to figure out how do I obey them. And sometimes there's tension between them because I have to, I have to love my neighbor, but I have to honor the Sabbath and, 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 and rest. And so when that comes in tension, what do I do? And so for, for a long time, the Jewish people started coming up with rules to help them apply the rules more effectively in their lives, to resolve those tensions. It's called halach. Or with all of them, it's a halakha. And so they had rules like, on the Sabbath, you have to honor the Sabbath and keep it all. You should rest, not work. So if I'm going for a walk, how far can I walk and still have it be restful? Like, how many steps can I take from my house? Since they had a number, you can take X number of steps. And beyond that, it's work, or as we call it, hiking. You can walk, but you can't go on a hike on the Sabbath day. But then there was a question, well, when do I start counting my steps? Because I live in this like family compound with my parents and my siblings and my cousins. And so when does my house end? Do I count my steps from my door to my parents' house or what? And so they had a rule that if your roof is within a certain number of inches or so from your neighbor's roof, it counts as one house. And so you can go to the family compound all around all day and you're always inside. And so it doesn't count as walking yet. You don't have to count your steps. And they had rules so they can understand and apply the 613 rules that God had given them. It's all a little bit crazy, isn't it? It's a lot of rules. They had rules upon rules upon rules. They have thousands of pages of their rules in the commentary on the Torah. In the first century, there was one group primarily that was focused on making sure people kept the rules, and they were the Pharisees. The Pharisees believed that the reason the Messiah had not come to deliver them from Rome is because people kept sinning. And so if they could just get people to stop sinning, Rome would be defeated, they would be free. And so they focused on making sure everyone followed the rules. And when you broke them, they would point it out to you and to all of your friends and to your non-friends, and to everyone in town, and they might make people shun you until you change, because you need to follow the rules. And they were very focused on the rules. Today, it's a little harder to find people who are as focused on the rules. We still see it, though, in one area, and we see it in youth ministry, and I'm Pastor Jeremy doesn't do this very often, but when we, in youth ministries, we get focused on the rules because as parents of teenagers, we just want our kids to not screw up their life, right? So we focus on the rules, and so they gather, and they, and they talk about dating relationships, and they have conversations about, well, when is it appropriate, and when do you cross line into sin? And so can I hold their hand? Can I hug them? Can I kiss them? And they try to, like, draw lines, right? And we get into the rules when it comes to our kids and making sure that we don't have grandkids when our kids are kids. That's what's going on, let's be honest, right? That's what's happening. And we get really concerned about the rules right then and there. 
Other places, we don't worry so much. I remember as a kid, there were rules on Sabbath observance on Sunday. We had a pool in my house, but we did not go swimming on Sunday. That is not totally true. If it got above 90, we could go in the pool before we went to bed to cool off because we did not have air conditioning, but we could not splash because then the neighbors would know. So we would go in and we would dip ourselves into the pool and then get back out so the neighbors did not know. Some of you are laughing because you remember doing it or being jealous when you realized other people had. You had to swim very slowly. My mother had rules like you could not use scissors on Sunday. I don't know why a scissors was work, but it was work in her house, so they could not use scissors. And you could not, you could not play games outdoors like baseball and that kind of stuff because you might sweat and that's like work. And so there were rules you had to follow. We don't do so much of that anymore. One of the reasons we can, we can find it harder to find those rules is, is we have changed something deeply in our understanding of what, what it means to be a disciple of Jesus that is not good. We have changed following God into obeying God, from obeying God into feeling good things about God. And I just want to point out, feeling good things about God is not actually following God. Believing good things about God or the right things of God isn't following God. As James tells us, even the devil knows who God is and agrees he's God, but he ain't following Jesus. It's obedience that matters, and so there's value in following those rules. But when we start making the rules, making our lives about the rules and not about the God that they're supposed to help us connect with, we get into trouble and we start getting a little judgmental. We start getting a little proud, maybe. We start focusing on condemning other people rather than on dealing with our own sin. And one of my favorite movies from the last 20 years is completely inappropriate. So I'm just going to tell you, you know, I'm not recommending you watch it, but it does make me laugh every time I watch it. It's the movie Saved. It came out in like 2004. It is a satire that pokes fun of, well, people who grew up in Christian schools like me. And so I can watch it. Maybe you can't, but I can because it's poking fun of me. And it tells the story of Mary who is in high school and she gets pregnant and she's going through all sorts of um, faith issues and morality issues, trying to figure all this stuff out. And at one point, the principal talks to some of the, the more upright girls in the school and asks them to come alongside and help Mary. Um, so they do. You could graciously call it an intervention, but it looks a little bit more like a kidnapping masking as an exorcism as they come alongside in their van and throw her in the van and try to cast the devil out of her. It's quite traumatic. And then she gets away, and one of them, get, one of the girls, the good girls, gets really mad at her and throws her Bible at Mary. It hits her. And Mary picks it up, and in my favorite line, this is the only reason I watch the movie, I love this line, she holds the Bible up and says, this is not a weapon. And every time I watch that movie, I get a little defensive. And I'll tell you why. They're really hard on us. The movie is brutally hard on Christians. Sometimes rightfully so. Like that line, that's a line we probably all need to hear. And sometimes not very fairly. And when I start getting defensive, I've learned to think of Matthew 23. Because this is what Jesus says about people who get obsessed with the rules and in making other people live up to what they think they ought to do. So what Jesus says in Matthew 23. We have a whole lot of scripture. We're going to read through. No comments on it. You just listen and let it wash over you a minute. So Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for people to see, and then we'll skip ahead. And Jesus says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when you have succeeded, you make them twice as much a child of hell as you are. Woe to you, blind guides! You say, if anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing. But anyone who swears by the gold of the temple is bound by that oath. 
Woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. You snakes, you brood of vipers, how will you escape being condemned to hell? I think it's safe to say that Jesus takes religious people who focus on the rules and getting other people to follow the rules and condemning those who fall short. He takes that pretty seriously. And he condemns it without any wishy-washy terms. Who thinks Jesus isn't sure what he thinks about Pharisees who are busy condemning people for their sin? Ah, Jesus wasn't clear. I mean, he only condemned them to hell twice, just in case the first time didn't stick. He takes it seriously. So if, if following the rules and getting lots of rules to, ma- to manage our behavior isn't the way that we get closer to the kingdom, the way that we move to that time when heaven and earth are one, what's Jesus' answer? For that, we turn to a chapter before. In Matthew 22, beginning at verse 34, we read this. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Rather than loving the rules, Jesus gives us a rule of love. They had 613 rules and then rules upon rules upon rules to explain them. And Jesus takes all of that and he says, no, it comes down to these two rules. Everything else is simply commentary on how do we love God and love our neighbor well. That's what it means that all the Torah and the prophets hang on these two commands. Everything else is interpreted through those two commands of loving God and loving your neighbor. Now, I don't want to give Jesus too much credit for creativity here. So, for a little context, because it was somewhat shocking, but we don't want to give him too much credit. The, the Shema, the love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, was said by every observant Jew multiple times a day in Jesus' day. You would start your morning that way, and then again when you prayed the next time, and the, like probably four or five times a day, you would recite the Shema. And so that was on everyone's mind all of the time. And we know of at least one other rabbi, Rabbi Akaba in uh, the 50s or 60s, also quoted Leviticus 19.18 as the companion to the Shema to summarize the law. You don't know of anyone else, so maybe Jesus beat him by just 20, 20 years or so, or maybe it was something that others had said before. But either way, Jesus summarized the law with those two commands, and what's different about Jesus is he lives out those commands perfectly. So we see Jesus love God with all of his heart, mind, and strength. And we see it early on in his life. Jesus was one of those people who memorized the entire Old Testament. I have a friend who memorized Romans over the past year. I find that amazing. It's like 16 whole chapters. That took him a whole year. Jesus memorized Genesis through Malachi by the time he was 18. How are you doing? Like, he's passionate about knowing the Word of God, right? Right? The whole Old Testament. So I got my Bible here. It's not the whole Bible because, you know, we got the New Testament too. So we could maybe get to our 22. But he had all of this memorized, word for word, all the way through. And given that he was a rabbi, he also had a lot of the commentary on the Old Testament memorized word 
for word. He loved the word of God and he loved knowing God through it. Before he started his ministry, he goes in the desert for 40 days and fasts in the desert. Now, have you ever missed a meal? Yeah. He didn't miss a meal. He missed 120 meals. Now, mind you, he had some sort of food late at night or you don't live 40, year, 40 days without eating anything, without drinking anything. But he fasted during the day, had a little bit of food at night, minimal amount of food for 40 days in the wilderness. I complain when I don't get six waffles. 40 days to seek God with all his heart and his mind and his strength. Have you ever done that? Jesus did. 40 days. Jesus was so committed to following God that when he comes to the Garden of Gethsemane on Monday, Thursday, he knows what God is asking him to do. The stress is so bad that he sweats drops of blood. His blood vessels start breaking down from the stress and the blood comes out with his sweat. Apparently, it can actually happen when you're under that much stress. And yet he still obeyed all the way to the cross. He loved God with all of who he was and obeyed him with all of who he was. But he also loved other people. And so just a couple stories off the top of my head. There's this woman at the, at the well. You remember the Samaritan woman? They're going through Samaria. And Jews know that Samaritans, a couple things you have to know about Samaritans. Half-breed Jews, you don't really like them very much, heretics. So I don't know what the comparison would be, but half-breed heretic people. Not good people. Rabbis were not supposed to talk to Jewish women in public. They could only talk to their close family members in private. They never talked to women in public. And yet, and Jewish men wouldn't talk to a Samaritan woman in public. And yet, here's Jesus, meets this woman at the well, and he talks to her. This woman's been divorced multiple times. In those days, women could not get divorced. Only men could. Women got divorced. They did not choose to get divorced. So this is not a woman who's broken her marriages. Her husbands multiple times have kicked her out and left her to fend for herself when she can't have a job and can't own property and could starve to death. This is a woman who has been rejected over and over again. And Jesus comes alongside and he talks with her and he honors her and he shows her respect. And he even gives her a role in the community. She's the first one to tell people that the Messiah has come in among all of the Samaritans. He gives her a place again. Or you think of a woman caught in adultery. She's dragged before Jesus and the crowd has the stones in their hand because that's the punishment. They're ready to stone her. And Jesus stands between the crowd and he protects her. The crowd eventually disperses and then he sends her off and says, don't sin anymore which is one, a call to live differently, but also a whole lot of grace for the sin she had been caught in. God loved her. Jesus loved her. Or we think of the lepers. So one of the things with leprosy is we know if you touch lepers, you can get it. And no one wants leprosy. That's bad. So no one touched lepers. But not only could you get it, if you touched a leper, you became ritually unclean and you couldn't go in the temple and worship God anymore. It separated you from God. And so Jesus sees lepers. And what does Jesus do when he sees lepers? He touches them. Forget about the law that says you shouldn't touch them. They need to know they're loved and accepted by God, so Jesus touches them. Now, Jesus is different than you than me. When Jesus touches unclean people, they get clean. When we touch lepers, we get leprosy. But still, Jesus touches them, and they get rid of leprosy, and, and they all get clean, and they all go into the temple. And then there's another story. It's one of Jesus' stories, not one about Jesus, one Jesus tells. It's one we know well. He tells the story of a man who's on his way from Jericho to Jerusalem on the desert road. It's isolated. It's narrow. He gets, he gets attacked by robbers. They beat him. They take his money. They leave him for dead. And then the priest and the Levite come walking by, and they see the man on the side of the road, and they go as far away from the man as they can because they want to follow the law. The Torah says that a priest cannot touch a dead body unless it's of a very close relative, like your mom and your dad and your siblings and your spouse and your children, not even your cousins or your grandparents. It's just that immediate family. If the priest touches the body on his way to Jerusalem, he will not be able to serve in the temple, neither will the Levite, and someone else will get that honor and someone else will have to do the work and they'll have to go home. They want to follow God. They are being observant. Everyone who hears the story knows they're the heroes. They're obeying the law of God. That's, they did exactly what they should do according to the law. And then the Samaritan comes by. The half-breed heretic. The religiously messed up, screwed up, does not get it guy. 
and he walks by the guy on the side of the road and the Samaritan picks him up. Could have been robbers waiting to attack him too, but he takes the chance. He picks him up, puts him on his donkey, takes him to Jerusalem, pays for his room, pays for his medical care. And Jesus says, that's what I mean when I say love your neighbor. Love even your enemy when they need help. Don't have warm feelings. Serve and take care of and heal them. That's what it means to love our enemies. So the temptation when you think about loving your neighbor is to make it safe for all of us. And so if I want to make it safe today, I would say, you know what, we need to love people who are going through terrible things in Syria and, and the Rohingya people in Myanmar, and we need to love people who are far away from us, so we should have warm feelings for them. But Jesus says to love your neighbors, so let's get practical. Who are your neighbors? If you live in a subdivision, this is what I tell you to do today when you go home. Draw a map of your, of your neighborhood and write down of the houses around yours, who lives in them. If you live in an apartment complex, draw a picture of your apartment and the apartments above and below and, and back and in front and write down who lives in those apartments. If you live in assisted living, write down the names of the people in your hall. Who lives there? What are their names? If you don't know the names of all of your neighbors, this is your homework today. It's very practical and easy, but somewhat humbling. Go to their house and do this. And when they open the door, say something like, I'm Greg, I've been your neighbor for 14 years, and I can't remember your name. Which is terribly embarrassing, right? But better to do it now than after 20 years. Get it over with. Just admit it. You met them when they moved in 12 years ago. You brought them cookies. And you know it's, it's Jill and... Just go ask. Because you can't love someone if you don't even take the time to know their name. So write down their names. And then actually get to know them. Have a conversation. Find out maybe something about them, like what do they do or what's going on in their life. And maybe in the next couple months, not even maybe, next couple months, invite some of them over. Like, have a meal. It's a great, this is the time of year to do this. I can't preach this in January because you won't do it. It's cold, right? So it's easy. This is your meal. You put your grill outside and you say, I'm grilling hamburgers. Let me throw some on for you. Come on over. And everyone eats hamburgers in the summer in Michigan. Put some hamburgers on. Get some veggie burgers just in case. You never know. Have some in case in the freezer just in case. Invite them over and actually share a meal with your neighbor. One of the ways you love people is eating with them and get to know them. So that as you have a relationship, when something happens in their life, you can actually love them because they'll tell you and you can respond because you know them. I have a great neighbor in my neighborhood. The Merritts live down the road from us. They have, like, they have four kids, so I identify with them a lot. And a couple summers ago when Officer Chatfield was battling cancer, Every week, I would see the, the, the dad and the son drive their, their lawnmower past my house all the way down the block to the cul-de-sac to the Chatfield's house. They had their lawnmower and the weed whacker and the rakes and everything else they needed, and they mowed the lawn and took care of all the landscaping of the Chatfield's house the whole summer. Every week, I'd see him go by. It's not fancy. There will not be any books written about the family that mowed their neighbor's lawn. No one else will hear about it except you guys now today, Right? But it was simple, it was practical, and, knowing, and because I know the merits, it was done in Jesus' name. They loved their neighbors. What would it look like if we loved our neighbors? If we at least started by loving the neighbors who live next door, and we started there. What would it look like in your neighborhood if that became the way things worked? A few generations ago, the danger we would have had in many of our churches is that we would add law upon law and we would judge people who fell short and, and condemn them for not living the right kind of way. Now we've made a different change, haven't we? Now, the only sin that gets condemned in our culture is the sin of judging other sin. Right? Otherwise, anything goes. As long as everyone agrees and everyone consents and never, no one feels bad about it, we don't feel like we can ever say that something is wrong. But love doesn't mean that we accept all behaviors and attitudes. I'm raising four children in my house. I love every last one of them. And some of our conversations are about things that they do that they should not do. 
and about what kind of expectations you have in, in the best way to live. Not because I don't love them, but because I love them, I have to have conversations that sometimes make them mad at me. Because when you love someone, you're willing to confront them when they're doing things that risk them. Whether it's risking their lives or their brains or relationships, whatever it is, you take the chance because they matter to you. If we're going to love our neighbors, we also need to remember the context of how we should love our neighbors, and that's Leviticus 19. Leviticus 19 is a great chapter in the Old Testament. You should go read it. I know no one reads Leviticus, but you should read Leviticus 19. Some of it's confusing. When you get confused, come talk to me after. But these are some of the things in Leviticus 19 that you should know if you want to know what love looks like. Leviticus 19 says that, we should, that love looks like honoring your mother and your father. It looks like caring for people who are poor. It looks like respecting people's property. It looks like paying people fairly for the work that they do. It looks like being honest with people when you're, when you're making deals and financial arrangements. It looks like um, protecting people who are weaker than you. It looks like refusing to seek revenge when someone wrongs you, but instead forgiving them. It looks like being sexually pure in your relationships. It looks like caring for foreigners and refugees. That's what it looks like to love your neighbor. Go read Leviticus 19. It's a better sermon than you're getting right here. So go read that. The love that God calls us to does not ignore morality. It calls us to begin to live into God's morality, into God's values, and into God's kingdom. To live not simply a personal morality, but a communal morality so that we're not just kind, but we seek to create a kind society. We're not just honest, but we seek to create a culture that values integrity and honesty and, and won't put up with lies and deceit and half-truths and spin to create that kind of a culture. It's the same moral love that led Jesus to say we need to turn the other cheek and love our enemies and bless those who persecute us. Imagine what our world would look like if we lived that way. Imagine what your neighborhood or our schools or our communities or our nation would be like if all Christians began to love God and love our neighbors. What if one-third of the world, that's roughly the number of Christians in the world, if one-third of the world said we're going to live according to this law of love in our relationships, in our world, if we began to take Jesus seriously, it would be awful hard to start wars, wouldn't it? And to drop bombs. It would be hard to tolerate homelessness on our streets. It would be hard to tolerate people who are going hungry and kids in inner cities having terrible textbooks while kids in the suburbs have great textbooks. It would be hard to tolerate any of that if you're loving your neighbor well. It would be hard to tolerate refugees stuck in refugee camps for 20 years because no one will let them come if you're loving your neighbor well. What would it look like? It's hard to even imagine. It seems unfathomable. How would it work out? Wouldn't someone else just abuse us if we lived that way? Wouldn't they take advantage of us? Wouldn't they do that? This is the question that Lee Camp asks in his book, Mere Discipleship. As he's reflecting on Jesus' command to love, he says, Jesus could not have meant that we take him seriously in the realm of social and political realities. After all, what would happen if everyone did that? Implication being our world would fall apart. As Scott McKnight says, it is the spineless cowardice of many in the church that we don't take Jesus seriously. For fear of being taken advantage of, for fear of looking naive or foolish, we explain away the command to love and take on the worldly value of self-preservation and the ends justifying the means. Because it is absolutely ridiculous to love your neighbor and love your enemy and bless those who persecute you and live according to the ways of Jesus. We know where it ends. It ends at the cross. That's the only place it ends every time because only one person did it well and it ends up at the cross. That's the way of Jesus. If you love your neighbor well, it ends up at the cross. But the beauty of the cross is the cross is not the end. Because after the cross is the empty tomb. The challenge for most of us is we're not willing to go to the cross. We want the empty tomb without having to actually love our neighbors and love our God with all of who we are. 
But that's not the deal Jesus gives us. The way we enter the kingdom is by loving God and loving our neighbor, whatever it costs. What would it look like for you today to take one more step toward loving God and loving your neighbor like Jesus does? In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we confess today that we are not good at loving you or loving our neighbors. It is more than we can do. And so we ask that your Spirit would empower and enable us to take another step today and another step tomorrow to love just a little bit more, to give a little bit more of ourselves back to you, that we might experience each day a little bit bigger glimpse of your kingdom come. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.